Hi, everybody. It's Renee Regeer from free to be Talks, and we are here with another segment of Body Talks. I'm really glad you're here today. Body image is complex. We've been saying this for a really long time, but making change does not have to be. And having raw, real, and imperfect conversations is part of these first steps of making that change in this new series called Body Talk. So today I have with me Dr. Jean Kilborn, who I'm very excited to have. She has been highly influential in my life. She is internationally recognized for her groundbreaking work on the image of women in advertising and her critical studies of alcohol and tobacco advertising. She's the author of the award-winning book, Can't Buy My Love, How Advertising Changes the Way We Think and Feel, So Sexy, So Soon, The New Sexualized Childhood, and What Parents Can Do to Protect Their Kids. Her prize-winning films based on her lectures include Killing Us Softly, Spin the Bottle, and Slim Hopes. She has lectured at about half of the universities and colleges across the United States and the majority of universities across Canada. And in 2015, she was inducted into the National Women's Hall of Fame. Jean, thank you so much for being here today. It's great to be with you. I okay. wish we could be with each other. <laughs> <laughs> me too. Yeah. Let's jump right into these questions. So why don't you tell me a bit about yourself and your body image journey? I've read about it, but for everybody else, um, we'll start with that. Well, starting, I mean, growing up, I, I grew up at a time when body image was much less of a concern than it is now. I mean, there was, uh, not that girls weren't, you know, encouraged to be attractive and all of that, and there was way too much emphasis on that for women, but uh, that we didn't have, you know, social media, we didn't have the internet, we didn't have Photoshop, we didn't have all of those things that put so much pressure on girls and women today. And there was uh, the body type that was desirable wasn't so incredibly thin. Um, so in fact, if anything, growing up, I was considered a little bit probably too tall, even though I'm not all that tall, um, and, and too thin for sure. Uh, but, and I wanted to be sort of shorter and I wanted to have larger breasts and I wanted to be curvier basically. So it was a kind of strange difference from the way things mostly are today. And uh, there was certainly, uh, there was, fat people were stigmatized then there's no question about that although i think probably not quite to the extent that is true today but in general there wasn't that much talk about dieting and and we were less concerned about you know what we were eating and that, I, mean, I remember going out after movies to get milkshakes and fries and there wasn't a whole lot of talk about oh i'm being bad you know there was none of none of that it was not an ideal time by a long shot but in that regard it, i think it was easier than, uh, than it is now. Uh, and for me, um, the main thing about body image really for me when I was young was that I, as a child, I felt fairly invisible and in my family and in my situation. But when I became about 15 or 16, I suddenly became highly visible because I was considered good looking, you know, beautiful or whatever. And the, the world started to pay a lot of attention to me um, at that time. And that was complicated uh, in, in the way I welcomed the attention, but in another way it was frightening. And, and it did feel, although there was no language to describe this, it did feel objectifying. So that was a, um, it was a huge shift in my life. And I also knew, I was somehow reflective enough to know even at the age of 15 or 16, that this was not gonna last long. <laughs> and that if I, I mean, I was in, invited to be in beauty pageants and to model and to do stuff like that. And I did some of it, but I knew that if I counted on this, if my value came from this, it was going to be a problem because it was going to be so short lived. And so, and, and interestingly enough, I mean, what's happened as I've grown older is, is exactly what does happen. You, you become less visible as you, as, for women as you grow older. So now I'm experiencing sort of the other part of that curve which is going from being highly visible to becoming gradually less and less visible. So it's that, that's that been the part of the journey for me that's uh, been more relevant than actually concerns about, um, about my actual body. I was, I was sort of blessed with a um, very speedy metabolism and with, you know, sort of a, a, um, a body type that turned out <laughs> A little bit a little too late for me as a teenager but eventually to be desirable so 
I didn't have issues in that regard, but I certainly have about other sort of aspects of appearance. Yeah. And from what I what I've read and when when I have watched you talk about your um, your life and how you you transitioned, so you were a teenager, you had this um, experience of becoming more visible, but then at some point you started to realize. I mean, you mentioned right now just that this wasn't going to last. Um, can you share for people kind of when that that the pivot that started to turn a little bit more and you started to um, start to start to en engage more in your studies and start to engage more in in this critical analysis of like kind of what was going on in not only in your life but just in the world around you around women and objectification and around um, uh, just how women were being viewed. Mm -hmm. um. I, as I said, I realized pretty early on that this um, being valued for how I looked was was a double-edged kind of sword, and uh, and that to me it always felt like it was sort of a little bit like being rich, but with the absolute assurance that someday you'd be bankrupt. And I remember a man saying to me when I was probably in my mid twenties, um, "Your beauty is an international passport," and I said, "Maybe, but it's one that's going to be revoked." And so that was always the feeling that this was something that was very short term. And that also didn't really have very much to do with me. It didn't really have to do with who I was or it certainly didn't have anything to do with my mind or you know anything like that. So I became um, involved, like many people my age, I, I was in the anti-war movement, the anti-Vietnam War movement, and then I became involved in the women's movement. And then uh, I began collecting ads uh, because no one else was looking at ads or taking them seriously in those days. And it seemed to me that they were, uh, the image that was being portrayed of women was so devastating, really. And so I started collecting ads and part, part of that had to do with the image of beauty, the ideal image of beauty and the ways in which women were told that our value depended on how we looked. Um, there were other aspects too, stereotypes like, the, you know, the housewife or the, um, you know, that other, other, aspects of that. It wasn't just body image, but that was part of it. And it also struck me, this was in the 70s. I started in the late 60s, but during the 70s, that the models were becoming thinner and thinner, and that this was a problem, and that it, it was going to create a climate in which there was inevitably going to be an increase in eating disorders and increasing pressure on girls to achieve a body type that was really basically is impossible uh, for I mean, you're born with this body type. If you're not, there's no way to, to diet yourself into it, at least not for long. So I, I put together a slideshow and then eventually made my first film, Killing Us Softly. But a lot of it had to do with my own personal sort of interests and experience with, with that. And some of it had to do with my being involved in the women's movement and just being interested in general in stereotypes and sexism. Mm -hmm. So... You started collecting ads and uh, put that together to that highly influential film, Clean Us Softly. Um, and you've also had the perspective of watching the media shift and watching the climate shift around the narrative of what is attractive and for women and um, just s seeing a number of things happen. Um, can you share a bit about the role that you think I mean, this is a loaded question, so feel free to take apart as much as you want. But the role that media, family, and friends play today in the developing body image. Mm -hmm. Well, I've always felt from the beginning that the media play an incredible role, an incredibly important role, and that um, family and friends, of course, do too, but family and friends are also influenced by the media. So yes. uh, the whole idea that uh, particularly with this, what's been the case here in the past, what, 40 years or so, where the ideal body type has been, uh, for women, has been so incredibly thin. I mean, that's, it's the first time in human history that that's been the ideal body type for women. I mean, if you look back at statues of fertility goddesses, or even painters, you know, Rubens, or, you know, Raphael, any of them, and and you see that the body type was of sort of rounded belly and broader hips. It was all about really childbearing most more than anything else, I think. Uh, so this idea that the, the, the woman's body should be 
sort of almost non-existent in a way, almost disappear, uh, is relatively new uh, and has done, you know, done an incredible amount of harm. And I've, I've said also from the beginning that I think part of this was a reaction to the women's movement, that as women in, in the second wave, sort of the late 60s, early 70s, as we began uh, opening up avenues for women to become more powerful and more uh, at work outside of the home and do all kinds of other things, which really it's sort of shocking, I think, for young women to hear that, that this was simply not the way it was, you know, 40, 50 years ago. Uh, but as that happened, it's almost as if the world responded by saying, all right, all right, women, you can be more powerful, but you're going to have to be incredibly frail physically. You're going to have to be thin. You're going to have to be smaller physically. You can't take up too much room. You can't be too full of yourselves, you know, all of that. And so two things happened sort of in response to the to the women's movement. One was this increasing um, emphasis on being incredibly thin, and the other was the increasing sexualization of little girls. So the other part of that was sort of, we're, and if you're going to become too powerful, we're going to replace you with little girls who are, you know, if the ideal for femininity is to be passive and powerless and dependent, and you're spurning that, then we're going to replace you with little girls. Now, I'm not at all suggesting that this was a conscious conspiracy. You know, it wasn't. But I think it was a result of the sort of the collective unconscious of the culture in a way, because people are so terrified of women being too powerful. And women are too. Many women are too. This is not something that's just true for men. So there was this terror that, oh my God, what's going to happen with this women's movement? Women are going to be so powerful. And, and, uh, the, and so the response was this kind of, this double-edged thing of the little girls being sexualized and the and women basically almost being told to disappear. In fact, I have an ad that I used in one of my early shows that um, said uh, of a woman exercising on a treadmill and it says something like, soon you'll both be taking up less space. And that was sort of the idea that, and another one says, uh, we're cutting Judy down to size. You know, that the idea that and if you think about size zero or size zero, zero, it's the idea of almost having women physically disappear, yeah. uh, which is just so, uh, so off, so disturbing on so many levels. And when you grow up in that culture, it influences so many, not just explicit beliefs, but implicit beliefs. It's like you, um, that, that that's the water that you're that you're living and breeding in, if we were a fish, so to say. Mm -hmm. And so as you were, understanding this uh, more and more and developing uh, uh, or writing your books and uh, researching these topics, you came across, you were coming away with all this really important information about like what our culture was telling us um, about women, how to look, how to feel, how to act essentially. And how did that translate in the day to day for you uh, to protect yourself? essentially, so that you could remain immersed in this field and yet at the same time protect yourself from the messages that you were decoding and that you were um, immersing yourself in, essentially, to, to learn more about them. Mm -hmm. um, I, I want to say one, one more one thing about that first before I answer that question, which is that sure. um, I started this so 50 years ago, basically, and the ideas then were, my ideas were considered radical. And so... Um, now they're so accepted and they're so kind of mainstream, but they really were considered radical then to the extent that even other feminists didn't think that this was an important issue. I mean, other feminists would say sometimes to me, um, oh, advertising, that's just too trivial to deal with, or uh, we're dealing with serious issues like violence against women, you know, not uh, something trivial like advertising. And I would say it's related because when you turn a human being into an object, you create a climate in which violence becomes more likely. And so the objectification of women really does contribute to the violence uh, against us. And also, of course, there were all the health issues like eating disorders and things like that. But I had to fight that for quite some time. Um, so that, there was that. Then there, when I started talking about the thin models, I remember um, being disparaged by people in the medical profession saying, uh, oh, it's, uh, you know, it's, these images don't contribute to, you know, these eating disorders. And in those days, you know, what they blamed for eating disorders, bad mothers, bad mothers, <laughs> as is always the case, right? It's always the bad mother. Uh, and 
now and then gradually they that that changed and then people began to come around so now it's sort of what what i say and have been saying for so long is is really quite mainstream but it really wasn't then but it's a good question that about how did I protect myself? And on, on many different levels, I mean, one was being immersed in the images, um, but in some ways that was kind of helpful because the more I saw them and the more I realized how, um, what the purpose of them was, I mean, to sell, to make money, you know, to make money for people and all of that, that I could be a little bit protected from that, just by that knowledge. Um, it, more important in many ways was the, that, when I started out as a, a young woman talking about feminism and sexism, we, women in those days weren't even really supposed to speak in public, you know, let alone about these kinds of issues. So I had to deal with some hostility. I mean, luckily there wasn't the internet, so I didn't get trolls, you know, but I did get hate mail and I got uh, some of that kind of thing. So, but what's always protected me in my life really mostly has been uh, supportive relationships with other women. And so I've had, you know, really deep, nurturing, lasting uh, friendships. And I was in, you know, what we call consciousness raising groups and, you know, groups where we could really talk about all these issues and, and laugh about them. I mean, having a sense of humor has always been helpful too. Um, as I mentioned to you earlier, I have three brothers and I think that, uh, you know, having us developing a sense of humor is essential if you're going to be a a girl, a girl alone with three brothers. <laughs> that was my opinion. <laughs> and so we live in this culture that you have for the last number of decades, just put a, put a microscope under to see how it in, influences us. And then you talked in the beginning just about how in the beginning, when you were younger, you felt in more invisible and then you became highly visible, real recognizing, I love that analogy that you used about this, the passport that was gonna be revoked at some point. And then you mentioned about how you you feel like you're on the other end of that spectrum now too, where um, um, feeling more invisible um, now. And so because we live in this culture, even I think that um, it makes so much sense that we, uh, still can be influenced by the ideas and messages around it. And so can you describe now, do you have hard body image moments, hard body image days? I mean, thinking about all these influences that are still out there, the, 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 the me, uh, media and messaging and whatnot. So do you still have hard body image days? And then what do you do to protect yourself um, or safeguard yourself um, mm -hmm. against them now? I have some, although I, to be honest, far fewer than I would have expected. I was so afraid when I was young and growing older. I mean, I knew that, um, <coughs> excuse me, I was afraid of losing my passport, you know, because it does, it does when you're, you know, young and considered beautiful, it does give you what can feel like power. You know, it can give you a sense of power. It was always, it, it never felt to me like authentic power, but it was nonetheless, you know, it was, and so I thought, what's it going to be like? It was going to be, and I would dread it, but it's actually has turned out not to be that bad at all. And there is some relief that comes with it because when you, you really do cease to be objectified in that way. So you don't have the same kind of just harassment on the street, you know, that was sort of such a part of my life for so long. Um, and so that's fine. And also I think when you get older, if you, if you had any, you have been lucky enough to have a, a you know, a good life. Um, these things, these issues become much less important. Other things become far more important, you know, way more important. The quality of your relationships, the kind of work you do, but, you know, it just, it's, it just matters. All of it matters much less to me than it, than it did uh, when I was young. Okay. What I hear from that, though, is just there's, there's so much meaning in your life. Like when you were younger, perhaps that was, like you said, it was a, a source of power, but it wasn't authentic power. And now you have power potentially in your relationships and, and meaningful, um, meaningful relationships and the work that you've done and all of the, and continue to do um, all are essentially like sources of deep meaning and, and for you. Is that, am I hearing that right? Yes, right. And of course, another thing, and I think this is probably related also to what we're experiencing now with the pandemic and all of the sort of chaos in my country. Um, 
when I, mean, when I think about how many people are suffering, you know, in so many ways, um, and it, it, it puts everything in perspective, you know, it really does. I mean, this is, um, I mean, this is a difficult time, you know, for all of us in some ways, but it, boy, it sure isn't for me in the ways that it is for so many people. And so it means that I'm, I'm much less inclined to be concerned about something that is, that feels more superficial, I guess. I have a, a much more, a much deeper understanding, which I think a lot of my fellow citizens do as well, which is one of the reasons why there's such a, I think, and I hope a profound change happening in this country yeah. as, as we understand on a much deeper level, the kinds of lives that, you know, most people, that many people are living, the lives of despair and, uh, I mean, the, the racism, of course, but also the sort of economic uh, situation and what, what's happening now with people is very, it's just heartbreaking. So I feel if I'm, if I'm, a, if I drift off to think about some, some problem I have, it, 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 it goes away fast. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which is not to say that, that being concerned about things like that is, is, is trivial or superficial. It isn't. It has tremendous impact on people psychologically and emotionally, and it really does affect our psyche. And in fact, one of the things I've always said about uh, what's done with women as we age in, in our, our cultures that is that um, is uh, does tremendous harm to women and really um, disempowers women in a way that's uh, serious, you know, that's not trivial yeah. at all. My friend Susan Douglas wrote a wonderful book recently called In Our Prime, which is about uh, the ways in which if women, as we grow older, could reclaim our power and use our power, that that really could, I mean, not only make us feel much better, but it could really transform the culture. So I think that that's true, that, that it's the emphasis, the incredible emphasis for women on how we look and what, what our bodies are like or whether we still look like we're 35, no matter how old we are, uh, just does, um, does, real, does real harm. It does real harm. It's not trivial. And I think what, like what you said, uh, body image is all related to that because it's, from my understanding as well, it's so much more than just um, focusing on our appearance because we live our lives through our bodies. Our bodies are the vehicles in the way we experience life, the way we use our voice, the way we engage or disengage in activities and whatnot. And so um, it's all highly co connected in, um, and influential in, in, in the course of our life. And so given, given the realities of COVID, given the realities of just like our current, our current climate that we're in right now, people are spending a lot more time online, um, a lot more time online right now. And there's, there's a lot of fear um, for, for some. If you could offer any ways, how do people protect themselves now, kind of on the day-to-day -day basis, um, to become more resilient, to become more confident, to um, experience the fullness of their life, even amidst the challenges right now. Like, what, what, are, some, what are some ways that you might um, offer some guidance in that? Well, I think the first thing is to, um, to educate oneself as much as possible about, uh, about where all this comes from, where all this pressure comes from, and who profits, and uh, you know, something like a diet industry that, you know, it's obviously is selling products that do not work because if there were a diet product that worked then that would be the end of it, right? But <laughs> they don't. I mean, 95% of all dieters not only regain whatever weight they lose, they go on to gain more. So, so what, and how are the diet industry and the junk food industry sort of in cahoots, you know? I mean, it's sort of a perfect combination that people binge on junk food and a diet. It's, it's so, to learn about that and to become media literate, I guess, and to really understand and be able to read these ads and understand them and understand that you feel the way you do because to some extent, because giant corporations want you to feel that way because it's extraordinarily profitable for them if you feel that way. The more anxious you feel, the more uh, worried you are about your own body or the more money you're gonna spend, you know? And the same is true with the aging thing. The more money you'll spend on anti-aging creams. And again, if there was an anti-aging cream that works, <laughs> you know, we'd all know about it. Uh, of course there isn't. Um, so I think learning about that is one thing. Another is what I mentioned before, having really supportive friendships, you know, especially with other women and being able to talk about the ways in which 
these images cause us real psychic pain. And, you know, sharing that can be really helpful in realizing that we're not alone. Um, finding ways to limit your time online, I think, is helpful, too. I mean, to really think of it, if you're going to diet, <laughs> have a social media diet, <laughs> you know, and really cut back because it's a phenomenal waste of time, mostly. I mean, I feel this myself when I get sort of sucked into spending time on um, and and it takes you away from doing other things that would make you feel much better and would be more rewarding. And it, it's not good for our self-image. It's just not good for our self-image at all to spend a whole lot of time online. Our self-confidence, our feeling, our self-esteem. So finding ways to, and it's hard because it's addictive, but finding ways to cut back to, you know, not not do it so so often to maybe have certain times of day, you know, when you check on, but not other times. So I, all of those things, I think, you know, could be helpful. Incremental, but like huge, huge impact on, on, on your life if you actually follow through with each one of those things. Well, I... Well, another, I want, let me say one more thing. Yes, um, The other thing is, I think, finding ways um, to use our bodies that uh, make us uh, appreciate our bodies, you know, being, whether it's you know, sports or games or just going out for a walk, you know, or being uh, anything like that. I know I felt entirely differently about my body after I um, gave birth. <laughs> you know, I suddenly had a new extraordinary amount of respect, you know, for my body. And it was like, oh my God. I mean, of course, everybody does this. But on the other hand, each time, doesn't it? It feels like a miracle. And yep. so... Um, and so what if I never had a you know flat stomach book again? I never had a really flat stomach anyway. It didn't. And, and what was important was that this body had been able to do this. And and so and I feel that way. I, I mean, I love to walk, and I'm, I'm a, a, and especially at this time of COVID, just being able to go outdoors and just take long walks and and feel grateful that I have you know that I had the strength to do that and that my legs work. I broke my leg. Uh, six years ago in a skydiving accident and uh, but <laughs> don't don't I won't go there uh, <laughs> I don't recommend it uh, but uh, but it, that gave me a sort of new appreciation now I sometimes walk and I think how grateful I am that you know I didn't shatter my leg beyond repair and that I can walk and it, so those kinds of things finding ways to be grateful to your body you know for all yeah. that it does for you uh, and to think of it that way, rather, and to do everything in your power to stop the negative self-talk, because that is something that we just all do, and it's something that's so incredibly damaging. And I mean, anything from like wearing a rubber band and, you know, snapping it on your wrist when you hear that tape begin about, you know, you're so fat or you're so old or you're so whatever, you know, that to stop it in its tracks and to realize you would not talk to a friend that way ever. Mm -hmm. So don't do it to yourself. Oh my goodness. So mm -hmm. many good, so many nuggets of wisdom there. Mm -hmm. And what you are really talking about essentially is a lifestyle, educating yourself, following through with what you're learning, realizing that it's impacting you and then putting practices in place to, to protect yourself because it's hard to protect yourself when you are getting contradictory messages for so much of your life. Mm -hmm. Um, on that note, I think that, I mean, I would love to talk to you for the rest of the day, but on that note, I think that we will end this for now. Thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me today. I really, really appreciated it. I think that there was so many moments there that people are going to be able to glean wisdom from what you've said to learn how to develop resilience, to become more confident um, in the body that they have now, irrespective of what it looks like and just making, thank you for making body image just so much more relatable and practical on the, on the day-to-day -day basis. So thank you. Well, thank you for coming up with such good questions. <laughs>